Every culture has their own mythology, and raider culture is no different. Raider culture isn't very noble, there's not much to admire about it, but they do have their own stories. And they've created their own mythological figures, one of whom is the grenade-throwing motorcycle man. His story begins the first time we visit Hardware Town. We're sent to Hardware Town by Abbott in Diamond City, who needs some more paint for the wall. As we approach, we hear Mayor McDonough extolling the virtues of the wall and defending himself. Everybody, everybody, I need everyone's attention. Diamond City has stood united for over 150 years. And what keeps us united are two things. First is the great green guardian behind me, the wall, our protector and our savior from the filth of the outside. And second is our faith and trust in each other. After McDonough's speech, we can talk with Abbott. Working hard? Don't touch the paint. Don't worry, I won't. Good. The wall keeps out the bad guys, so I appreciate you not messing her up none. Whatever. Whatever? Hmm. You don't know what this is, do you? This is the wall. A great green guardian. Uh, no one's broken through the wall. Never. Least we can do for her in return is keep her looking pristine. Thinking you need a little education. Maybe a bit of community service. What do you say? What do you need done? You see this paint I'm using? Only one place left in the whole Commonwealth you can get it. Hardware Town. Rune store close by to the west. Bring back a can of paint, and it'll be a hundred caps in your pocket. How's that sound? What can you tell me about Hardware Town? Raiders moved in a ways back. Security says they can't handle them. That's why I'm running low. Paint retrieval. I'm on it. Much obliged. Hardware Town is a short walk west of Diamond City. As we get close, we hear cries for help. She's going to die. She needs help. Anybody! Help! Hurry! She's in here! Please help! I don't know many settlers who have their faces painted up like clowns. Something fishy about this. Our suspicions are confirmed almost immediately upon entry. She's right back here! Hurry! Hey! I told you to bring him into the basement! Shut up! They're headed this way now! Be ready! Raiders. They ultimately blow their own cover as we reach the employees only door. What is taking so long? I don't know. Maybe you should go check it out. You don't think I will? I'm tired of sitting on my ass anyway. What's the point of hiding back? Huh? Get up, don't you die on me! I'll keep a pin! Get out! We learned in a video earlier this week that this raider gang was set up by Bosco from the DB Technical High School. This small gang is an extension of Bosco's downtown gang empire. Since we come to Hardware Town at such a low level, this is likely one of the more difficult raider encounters we'll come upon. This character was only level 5 at the time, and I had to replay it multiple times before I lived. The Hardware Town is a small little interior cell with a little bit of good loot. We find a first aid kit on the wall just inside the shipping room. And and then an ammo container sitting on top of a crate near a stairway that led up to where Demo was seated. This second floor is pretty small. Heading through a door to the hallway and then through another door, we reach the main hardware store office. Here we find the storage key and a copy of Picket Fences, which allows us to build high-tech lighting in our settlements. Here we find an end of dungeon steamer trunk, and we can use the key to unlock the storage room at the end of this hallway. Here we find a master locked safe with randomized loot inside, a bottle cap mine, and a duffel bag. 
There's also a first aid kit that we don't want to miss on the way out. From here, we do find a collapsed floor leading down to a first floor bathroom, which in turn leads down to a basement. But we're going to explore the basement from a different direction. Instead, going back outside, we can go across some scaffolding the raiders had built to some storage shelves. Leaping between the shelves, we can loot some ammunition and chems on a perch that the raiders had set up. And then leaping across the shelves, we can climb up a tipped over shelf to find an advanced lock safe with more randomized loot inside. Back on the ground, near to a forklift, we find a wooden crate, and this leads us to a ramp that we can take down where we find a pile of human bodies. These are settlers and scavengers who had fallen for the same trick that these raiders tried to play on us. Hard to believe, after seeing their lack of subtlety, that anyone would fall for this trick, but the evidence is hard to deny. Going through a hole in the wall, we reach another portion of the base we see a ramp leading up to the bathroom we saw earlier, and a stairway leading up to a delivery hatch behind the building. But we need to mix some paint. So going back upstairs, we find a shelf of blue and yellow paint right next to a paint mixer. Now we can take the blue and yellow paint as it is, or we can use the paint mixer to mix the blue and yellow together to make a can of green paint. Having at least one of each color gives us more options when we return to Abbott at the wall. Now that we have our paint, we can leave out the rear entrance where we hear the first story. You see the last one we tried to pull in with all the grenades? Oh, I was out doing my rounds. What about them? Well, Becca pulled him into the front of the store and everything seemed fine, right? He must have got spooked or something because he suddenly starts throwing grenades everywhere what what would what, you guys do that's the thing it turns out they weren't grenades at all they were just rocks he was making the sounds with his mouth pins being pulled all nine yards <laughs> fucking nuts did you guys take him out no we just stood there we couldn't believe what we were seeing after he threw about a half a dozen rocks near the back of the store he started making machine gun noises and backing toward the door once he got outside it sounded like he pretended to get on a motorcycle which, of course, didn't start right away. <laughs> then he took off toward the freeway at what sounded like full throttle, shifting gears and everything. That's insane. How does someone like that survive out here at all? I don't know. There's some lunatics out there, though. A lunatic? Heck, it doesn't sound like a lunatic to me. It sounds smart. After all, it worked. The raiders were so stunned that this clever guy got away with his life. It's not stupid if it works. But is that it? Is that the end of this story? No, the story continues. But before we can listen to part two, we need to finish killing these raiders and then head back to Abbott at Diamond City. You're back. You find that paint? What if I couldn't find any green paint? What happens? Hmm. People wouldn't be happy. It's the great green guardian after all. Tradition and such. But if it's between a new color and letting the war go into disrepair, I'd know what I'd choose. Wasn't easy, but I found some, yeah. Now that's damn fine news. Why don't you go ahead and paint the first stroke? Let's see how the shade matches up. We then go over to the wall. Activating it gives us an option to use any of the different colors of paint that we found at Hardware Town. If we choose yellow, we place a big streak of yellow on the wall, and Abbott is not happy. Yellow? You know what you're doing there? A wall ain't yellow. If we choose blue, the same thing happens. We put a big streak of blue, and Abbott is displeased. Blue? You know what you're doing there? The wall ain't blue. Well, don't like it? Too bad. Well, I can't begrudge the person who did the actual work, but you're flying in the face of over 200 years of tradition here. There's gonna be talk. Oh, well. Better than seeing her in disrepair. Here's your payment. Now get going. I got work to do. But if we choose green, Abbott is satisfied. Hmm. That's a good shade of green. The wall sure seems happy with it. The wall seems happy with it? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, make with the jokes. But you still helped. You think that's enough paint to last you? Should be enough for a good coat or two. That'll have to do for now. There's your payment, and a little bonus for getting the right shade of green. Don't do anything with it I wouldn't do. We complete the quest, and we get double the reward. Always happy to help a hard-working old man out. 
Now part two of the motorcycle grenade throwing man is a bit tricky to find. No quest brings us here, not even a radiant quest. Instead, we have to chance upon it while exploring downtown Boston. To find it, we need to go to the Trinity Tower area. Just outside Trinity Tower, right across from the Boston Public Library, we find a big building with a back alley bowling sign on it. This is an enclosed parking garage with a big P above the garage entry. And and just outside the garage is a dead Brahmin. If we're careful to sneak in, we hear a conversation. So I'm keeping an eye on those mutant freaks over at Trinity, and this guy comes out of nowhere sprinting down the road. I know he must have seen him standing there from way down the street, but he didn't slow down or even duck into one of the alleys. What the hell? What'd they do to him? The hounds must have ripped him to shreds. By the way, this guy ain't got nothing on him, like ten caps and a desk fan? Who carries around a desk fan? Ah, damn it. Anyway, they didn't do nothing to the guy. I think, I think they were as confused as I was. Get this, the guy was making sounds. What do you mean? Was he screaming or something? Not really. It was almost like he was making motorcycle sounds, like he was pretending he was riding one or something. He was even making gear shifting noises and everything. So what? Did they just let him drive right by? <laughs> yeah, but he didn't just drive by. He reached in his bag, but didn't seem to take anything out. Until he pulled his hand toward his mouth like he was biting something. Then it looked like he threw it into the Trinity lobby. What the fuck? What was it? What did he throw? Nothing. I think he was acting like he threw a grenade at him or something. A second or two later, as he drove his bike down the road, he made a loud boom sound, as if the grenade he had just thrown had exploded. <laughs> Are you serious? What a fucking wag job. Whoa, whoa! I think this guy's still moving. And motorcycle grenade throwing guy strikes again. This time against the super mutants. I would love to meet this guy. But is that it? Is that the end to the tale? Well, maybe. And maybe not. We find one more interesting raider story like this inside Backstreet Apparel. Cleaver leads the raider gang stationed here, which is also part of Bosco's network of downtown raider gangs. The only quests that send us here are radiant quests from the different factions, like kidnapping for the Minutemen, fetch and retrieve quests from the Institute and the Brotherhood of Steel, and so on. We find the place by going south across the bridge next to the wreck of the USS Riptide. On the other side, we turn left to see the front of the apparel shop, highly defended by raiders. There are two machine gun turrets and a tripwire attached to a missile launcher inside a concrete tube, not even to mention the raiders outside. But once the raiders are dealt with, the third story begins as soon as we enter. And if we're not sneaking, we miss it. Gentlemen, you have any more stories like that? How much time you got? <laughs> yeah, I have a few. Let me see. A couple years back, before I met Clutch, me and a couple friends found a young kid on the north side of the Charles. He wasn't that young, probably around 18 or so. Anyway, after hanging out with him for a while, it started to get dark, so I built a fire. I kid you not, as soon as I lit the first match, the kid screams, What are you doing? And knocks the match out of my hand. He knocked the match out of your hand? Why'd he do that? Shh! I'm telling a story. So, yeah, he knocks the match out of my hand. I was so surprised that I swung and broke his nose. He said he was sorry. And get this, he said he was afraid of fire. Oh man, he was afraid of fire? I just told you he was afraid of fire. You keep interrupting me, it's irritating. As soon as he told me that, I thought of something. I quickly apologized for hitting him and told him it's nothing to be ashamed of. That night, me and the others got this kid so drunk so fast, he passed out within an hour. We then dragged him to the banks of the Charles. We also dragged six or seven mattresses and tied them in a circle with one in the middle. Mattresses? What did you need the mattresses for? Really? Did you seriously just ask me that question? It's a goddamn story. All you have to do is listen. So yeah, we tied all these mattresses together, and then we placed one mattress in the middle, and put the kid on it. We doused all the mattresses with gas, except his, and then lit them on fire and pushed them down into the water. We followed the burning mattresses down the river, laughing our asses off waiting for the kid to wake up. 
After five minutes, we realized the kid wasn't going to wake up. So we all started throwing rocks at him. After a couple of hits, the kid's awake. At this point, the flames were huge. <laughs> Imagine what it must have been like for him. Waking up, not knowing where he was, and all he sees is fire. The kid tries to stand up, but can't get his footing on the soggy mattress. At this point, I'm laughing so hard I fall down. That is crazy! I bet he overcame his fear of fire. Huh? Trial by fire? Nah, he never did. Turns out the kid couldn't swim. Anyway, that's that. Didn't see that coming. He couldn't swim, so I guess he died. His horrible raiders killed the kid. But was this kid the motorcycle guy? Is this the ignominious end to such a clever survivor? I'm not entirely sure. It seems strange to me that the fable of Motorcycle Guy would end with only two tales. You'd think the raiders would have elaborated on this mythology, but there really are no more stories. I even opened the creation kit and printed off the script for every single raider dialogue in the entire game, and then searched for anything mentioning motorcycle or grenade, and the only two stories I found were the two I just played. So this really is all of the information we have in the game. Part of me thinks that this kid is not the motorcycle grenade guy. After all, it kind of sounds like the kid was trying to be a raider, like he had just recently joined a gang and his death was just part of raider hazing gone bad. I don't think they intended to kill him, though they certainly weren't all that heartbroken that they did. So my bet is that this is an entirely different story. But if so, then who is the motorcycle grenade guy? Is he still alive? Does he still walk the Commonwealth? I don't want to start up another fan conspiracy theory, but honestly, the only person we've met whom I think could even come close to doing some of the crazy antics of this motorcycle guy is Deacon. Maybe Deacon pulls out his motorcycle grenade guy when a special ops mission for the railroad goes bad. When his cover is blown, when they see through his disguise, he manages to sneak away by perplexing his enemies with his whole motorcycle grenade guy routine. It's certainly a possibility, but we don't have any concrete answers. But this whole story is likely a reference to Michael Winslow of Police Academy fame. The Police Academy movies were a comedy series that dominated the 1980s. Michael Winslow was one of the stars of the series, and he was well known for all of the funny noises he made with his mouth. He would often get his friends out of trouble by making some crazy sound effect. His gags were really similar to those of Motorcycle Grenade Guy here in Fallout 4. Ridiculous, off the wall, pretty implausible, but doggone hilarious. Mel Brooks fans would remember him as the radar technician from Spaceballs. And is anyone else surprised that raiders in 2287 know what a motorcycle sounded like? I mean, we don't have any moving road vehicles in Fallout 4 or Fallout 3 or New Vegas. They did, of course, exist before the war. We find lots of lone wanderer motorcycles all over the place. These were nuclear powered, but we don't have any evidence that any of these motorcycles still work. But these raiders knew enough about motorcycles and the sounds that they made to be able to tell that a person was pretending to be shifting gears on a motorcycle. Motorcycle. That takes Motorcycle Grenade Guy knowing what shifting gears on a motorcycle sounds like and having the expectation that his audience would as well. Does this mean that there is some place close to Boston where vehicles still work? Or does it leave open the possibility that we'll find a Creation Club offering or a mod that brings us working motorcycles and vehicles that we could consider canon? But what do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Do you think Motorcycle Grenade Guy and the Flaming Mattress Kid are one and the same? Or do you think that they're different people? What did you think of this Raider mythology? Would you like to see Bethesda flesh out these stories and maybe add new ones in future games? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning bright and early with a brand new video.